All right, it's 12 o'clock, so let's get started. Welcome everyone to our weekly webinar here from One Schoolhouse. I'm Sarah Hanawald, the Assistant Head of School for Professional Development, and I am delighted to share today's guest with you, Dr. Tom Rashan from ERB, and he's gonna be sharing some insights on how students are growing during this disrupted year. Before we get started, I'm just gonna remind you a little bit about what's coming up. On our blog by Peter Gao, we have content learning loss and what actually matters. And next week's webinar, we're gonna talk about, is it time for intentional curriculum work? There has been a ton of curriculum work going on in schools this year that's been reactive and lots of pivoting and adjusting. So, you know, is it time to uh, take back the intentionality behind that work? And then I just wanted to remind everyone about upcoming professional development here at One Schoolhouse. We have courses designed particularly for department level leaders on assessing and adjusting the curriculum for the rest of this year, much of which has been informed by the conversations that Tom and I have been having. And then we also have um, some partnership courses with IBSC on best practices in boys education that will be starting on February. So head over to our website and check out any of those. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. And thank you for joining us today, Dr. Rashan. And I am going to um, change my view just a little bit to help with the video. And I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself. Can you tell everybody else, uh, everybody here, a little bit about you and your work? Hi, thanks, Sarah. So first of all, thanks so much for the invitation. and. Um, I, I have some, uh, as you indicated in the title, some data to share today on the, uh, you know, real data on the extent of uh, learning loss, uh, or actually it turns out to be a loss of learning momentum uh, since uh, spring of 2020. Um, and uh, you'll be the first audience to, uh, uh, to see this outside of uh, ERB and its board of trustees. But um, so I'm really excited to especially to, to be here today. But so to give a little bit of context, um, uh, I think probably virtually everybody uh, on this webinar knows ERB, which has been around for uh, 90 years to provide uh, tests for independent schools. And for essentially all of those 90 years, we've treated each test as, a, as an individual event. The school requests the testing to be done. We supply the tests, you know, paper in the old days, often digits nowadays and uh, the test is administered, we send score reports, and it's filed as a separate event. Beginning just a few years ago, we began to create uh, uh, records at the student level over time of, uh, of, of test results. And this enables schools to do analysis of how the school has evolved over time, maybe uh, examine a particular uh, grade or a particular subject level, maybe follow a track a particular class as it moves through the grades in the school, uh, or uh, of course, look at an individual and uh, see what their trajectory uh, might've been. It also provides, and this gets to where we are today, an opportunity to analyze any major event. Let's say the school introduces a, a major curriculum change in mathematics. Well, what does that do in terms of test score uh, trends over time? Or in this case, Let's say a pandemic disrupts uh, learning and suddenly schools on very short notice are forced to close their campuses and go to a distance learning model. And then of course at this year, distance learning kind of morphed into hybrid learning. What's the impact of that? So we now have uh, the data organized so that we're able to look at those kinds of trends. And that's what I wanted to share today, Sarah. Great. Well. Thank you. And as you and I have been talking about this preliminary research, um, I'm excited to share with everybody that it's being released in its final format on Friday. So those of you attending this webinar live on Wednesday are getting a sneak preview. We're definitely going to reserve some time for Q&A. So if you'll use the chat for sharing resources and connecting with one another, and then use the Q&A for answering questions, and I'll field those for Tom. So Tom, Tell us a little bit about what you've been examining. I know you've got some slides. So can you tell us a little bit about the data set and what you've got? Great, thanks. Yeah, first, uh, so before I, I, I just, I, I think the main thing is to, uh, to show you the, the data and what the results actually are, but let me describe a little bit uh, what, we, what we did. First, um, uh, I, like I'm sure many of you, 
started reading uh, approximately mid-fall some of the reports that were coming out from various analysts based on national testing programs, which means primarily based on students in public school districts uh, in, um, in, in large cities and, and other areas of the country. And those showed a very significant and concerning degree of what, what came to be called COVID learning loss. Um, the, the typical results were that there were three to five months of uh, lost learning compared to where students might have been. And when you consider that those findings were coming out in the fall and were reflecting uh, March onward, five months loss is practically zero progress in learning because there had only been about five months of, of school. So naturally we were um, uh, concerned and interested to understand what does this look like in independent schools where ERB of course has a, a strong database thanks to the CTP or comprehensive testing uh, program data. So what we did was create um, a subset or a panel of students in schools across the country who tested in fall 2018 and again in fall 2019 and again in fall 2020. And by looking at their uh, growth rates from fall 18 to fall 19, we established what we would consider the, their normal growth rate. And then by looking at their growth rate from fall 2019 to fall 2020, we're able to see the impact of spring 2020, uh, which of course was an intervening uh, event. So right. with that as, uh, as context, let me, let me uh, uh, share what we have here. Um, so the first thing I want to, um, uh, let me um, actually do this a little bit nicer and actually show it as a, the, uh, the first thing that I want to uh, want to mention is, um, and this is the overall uh, score trend of students taking CTP from uh, the end of first grade. That's the that's the earliest CTP there is. It covers first grade material right through the fall of eleventh grade. And the one thing that's important from this particular graph, this has nothing to do with the, the uh, COVID related disruptions, is that you'll notice the growth curve is much steeper in the first part than later on. It, it, um, it just, the score, the score trend naturally kind of um, moves a little bit less from year to year. The significance of that is since we're following students over two years and they're in a higher grade in the second year than the first year, you would expect less score change in the second year than the first year. So some of what you're about to see in terms of a slowing of learning growth is a natural artifact, if you will, of the fact that the students are one year older and they're taking the test at, at one higher level. The rest of it is, is uh, going to be COVID or disruption related. So what did we find? Um, first, you can see the, uh, so the blue bars are the student growth in this special sample of students who took the test in three consecutive falls, uh, their student growth from 2018 to fall 2019. And that establishes the, the normal pattern, quote unquote. And uh, you can see that the blue bar is in every case higher than the, I don't know what to call it, the gold or the golden rod or the, the mustard colored, uh, mustard colored. You can just use yellow. <laughs> uh, I'll call it yellow. Thank you. Thanks for letting me off the hook. Um, and, uh, so, and, uh, and again, part of that is that they're one year older, they're one grade higher. You would expect those bars to be lower. But these differences are, in fact, more substantial than we would normally see. Um, and, uh, and it's across the board. You can see we have several measures here, two, the first two related to math, math and quantitative reasoning, and then the other three measures are related to ELA, um, reading comprehension, writing concepts and skills, and verbal reasoning. So this, this, by the way, for those of you not familiar with CTP, these are five uh, subtests or tests given within the CTP program. So each one generates its own score. Right. And so looking at this, it looks like there are areas that are more affected than other areas. And I just want to add in that most people in education are very comfortable with the idea, of just like when our children are very small, there's rapid growth and then things start to level off. Um, and certainly growth continues every year. I'm not trying to say that, but yes. It does change, but where do you see areas that are most affected? So when you when you look at these graphs, and I real, realize it's, it's kind of a visual thing at this point without uh, really showing the percentage differences, 
but you'll notice that quantitative reasoning and verbal reasoning have a bigger delta from 1819 to 1920. The, 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 yellow, the yellow bar is, uh, is, is has a bigger gap uh, from the blue bar. And from this, I, I would conclude that although many of the national studies emphasized math as a particular area, by the way, let me, let me mention the, the non-finding here. We're finding approximately very similar amounts of slowing of growth, both in math and in ELA. There's not a, a math crisis, as it were. But there is a greater slowing of growth when it comes to our two measures of reasoning, uh, which leads me to conclude that as students were given more, necessarily given more independence and uh, could no longer be in the classroom every day, their ability to absorb new material and new facts wasn't as affected as their ability to work with that material, to incorporate it into their reasoning process, and to use it for problem solving. That seems to be a bigger um, a gap or a bigger slowing created by the lack of teacher contact in the classroom. And when you and I talked about this before, you know, and I think about academic leaders and their role in the school, the, the big goals, right? The transfer goals, the things that carry forward that are aligned with your mission and your port, picture of the graduate, all of those things, those are the things that we want to most privilege in this time. And it looks like those are the things that are most vulnerable for students. It, exactly, exactly so, Sarah. I think, I think this points a little bit to, you know, thinking ahead to um, uh, past this spring and, and into, the, into next fall. Uh, where, where does attention need to be given in, in the classroom? And obviously there's going to need to be some uh, sort of level setting of where students are and uh, uh, sort of getting them to a certain place. But there will need to be a lot of attention with not just what do you need to know, but what do you do with this knowledge? How, how is it useful and how can you use it to solve problems? Right, and if I were thinking about something that I could do sooner, I would think about my feedback mechanisms, right? We know that students make bigger loops, leaps when feedback is quick. And I think there's so much over the shoulder. Okay, I see what you've done here. Now let's look at this problem. How can you apply what you just tried in this new problem that looks different to you? So teacher is teaching transfer, student is making the leap and it's less than 30 seconds of interaction. And I think that's something that teachers are masterful at and don't necessarily always even know that they're doing it and thinking about how do we try to incorporate those moments more into the instructional practices for the rest of this year. It, it's a good point. Of course, those things can happen um, uh, when the teacher and the student aren't stand, standing side by side, uh, but um, it does appear that they were more likely to happen uh, pre-March 2020 than they've had then since. Right, and that doesn't mean that they can't happen. Certainly we've been teaching online for a long time and others have as well. So it's just a, a case of trying something different in some of those instances. So one of the things that you shared with me too is the uneven distribution of the impact. Yes, uh, we looked at a number of um, uh, uh, aspects of, so who, uh, this is the to total population of course that we studied in this graph. Uh, who seems to be more affected? And one thing that we did was divide students into three groups uh, compared to the independent school uh, norm that we that uh, that CTP establishes nationwide. Uh, the group called low here are in the bottom three trinines, uh, stay nine, sorry, bottom three stay nines of the CTP distribution, uh, which is roughly the bottom quartile, very close to the bottom quartile. Middle is the middle two quartiles, so spanning the 50th percentile. And high is those who are in the top 25% or the top quartile of the independent school distribution in math, reading comprehension, and writing concepts and skills. And um, you can see, first of all, uh, again, let's just take a look at the blue bars for a moment. And you'll notice that from one year to the next, from 18 to 19, the normal pattern, uh, the, the students in the low end of the distribution show the most growth. And I want to emphasize that, that we very typically find that uh, from one year to the next. There's a couple reasons for that. One is that students in the low part of the distribution have more potential to learn grade level material in the intervening year. There's simply uh, more for them to catch up on. And of course, some of them catch fire as students and, 
and, and flourish and they're, they're ready to move forward. In addition, it's my assumption that teachers and learning specialists uh, particularly focus their efforts on students who are in the, the bottom quartile uh, of CTP distribution, even if they don't look at CTP scores to identify those students. And so those students are really very well served uh, by, in, by their school um, under normal circumstances. So that pattern of growth in which the, uh, the lowest quartile uh, shows twice as much growth as the middle and the middle not quite twice as much as the high, that's normal. When you look at 1920, you see a very different pattern across the three groups. And at first blush, you might say, well, wow, that's great. Uh, it, they're pretty much even. So one group has not been affected as much as another. But of course, the relevant comparison is between the normal year, if you will, the year that has not been disrupted and the disrupted year. And in that sense, you can see that the greatest penalty was paid by the group in the bottom quartile compared to the growth that we assume they would otherwise have had if there had not been the disruptions that began in March 2020. In fact, at the high, uh, the, the top quartile, um, not really affected on average, um, their, their growth continued, which just suggests knowing that many things were going on at the time but it suggests that those students were more successful in transitioning to a different model of instruction in which more responsibility was inevitably placed on them because they weren't uh, in a classroom every day under the direct oversight of a teacher. So this has some interesting implications for academic leaders to think about e even in terms of hiring for next year. Is this, a, this certainly isn't a year to cut your learning support staff, for example. And I think this is a case where individuals will want to look at their own school's profile and think about where are our students and which, which students do we want to most um, adjust for or who needs the most adjustment and how are we going to do that? Yeah, that's right, Sarah. And again, you know, I think um, Having a um, sort of a level set analysis of some kind, I mean, for my, um, from my perspective, uh, offering a standardized assessment that gives you very clear information, but I'm sure there are other ways to get that. It's going to be so important to know exactly where each student is uh, coming into the, at the end of this year and coming into the new year, um, and then um, uh, noticing that there will need to be special attention uh, for some students. Incidentally, uh, so this is our, our, what I would call our subject tests, math, reading comprehension, and writing concepts and skills. We did the same uh, analysis for the verbal and quantitative reasoning. Remember, those were more affected uh, by the by the spring uh, disruption, and um, it's exactly the same pattern. Uh, uh, in, again, the biggest penalty paid by those uh, who were in the bottom quartile uh, coming into you know as a before just before March 2020, if they were in the bottom quartile, they paid the biggest penalty in terms of slowing of uh, learning growth, loss of momentum uh, after that. Okay, that's really important, I think, as an academic leader to think about if you want to prioritize reasoning growth and you want to think about the big picture, knowing which students are most vulnerable on your campus and how to, to protect that growth. So I'm curious, um, what about variation within these groups? Right. So one thing that's gotten a lot of attention in the um, uh, in the national studies uh, is the uh, the differences uh, between different racial and ethnic groups um, in in learning loss and uh, and an emphasis that the that students of color have been disproportionately affected. I wish uh, I could present data on that. But the, the truth is we don't, uh, when we administer the CTP test, we do not ask students to self-identify their race and ethnicity. And the reason we don't is that there's a very strong, uh, very well-established research base that says that when you ask someone to think about their and identify their race and ethnicity, and then immediately after that, take a standardized test, it actually influences their performance on the standardized test. It's called stereotype threat, and it's the uh, unfortunately, the internalization of social uh, bias and stereotype that, uh, that affects student performance. So we try to avoid stereotype threat by simply not asking. The downside, 
we don't have the data uh, to, we don't know which of these students might be white, which of these students might be of color. But we do have information on gender and those results are really interesting. Again, we divided the students into low, middle and high, the bottom quartile, the middle two quartiles and the top quartile of performance. But now they're also divided by gender. And the results are broadly similar across the two, except you can see that especially in the bottom quartile and the top quartile, boys are more affected by the disruption than girls. And in fact, there's one absolutely remarkable uh, finding in this particular graph. If you look at the high performing girls, the high achieving girls, the top quartile, you will see that their performance from their growth from fall, uh, 20, uh, <laughs> fall 2019 to fall 2020, spanning the disruptions of spring and fall 2020, they actually increased their rate of learning compared to the rate of learning in the previous year. Um, the greater independence that all students had, once again, as they were out of the classroom part of the time, or maybe in the spring, out of the classroom full time, uh, actually for high achieving girls was a sort of, um, I, I don't know if I can say it this way, a sort of a, a liberation from the classroom following their enthusiasms and look what happened. Um, it's the only group uh, for which we see that kind of result, but it's quite striking. I'm fascinated by that and I have some opinions. I would love folks, if y'all would share in the chat your thoughts on some of these. And then if you've got questions, they're starting to come into the Q&A. Please share your questions. And Tom, when, when we were looking at this before, I asked you to define what constitutes high, middle, and low. Can you just remind everybody of that? Yeah, so again, um, this is defined by their CTP scores. Actually, it's in the year prior to 2018. So we wanted a benchmark that wasn't caught up in these data themselves. So these students also took the test in fall of 2017. And we use that to uh, stratify them into um, into three groups. The low group scored in the uh, bottom 25% compared to the independent school norm. These are still pretty good students as compared to the independent school norm. The middle group are between the 70, uh, 76th and 25th percentile uh, in the uh, independent school norm. So it's a very broad group. And the high group are those who are in the top 25% or the top quartile of performance of all independent school students nationwide. Great, thank you. Um, and the other thing that I think we need to just acknowledge and remember is that students are learning, right? They may not be learning the things that we're measuring in all cases, but there are students who are learning. I spoke with a young woman who is learning to manage a pod of younger children. She has siblings and then has also been uh, charged by her parents with caring for some neighbor's children. And she is supervising the remote learning of all of those children. I, I think we could say that she's grown a tremendous amount this year. And I don't know what her CTP scores are or, or how that came out. I just think um, Peter does a nice job of that on our blog too, of acknowledging that kids are some learning some things that we haven't necessarily previously measured and that we need to make sure that we value and honor when we think about going into the next year. I really uh, liked a phrase, Sarah, that uh, you and Peter and a couple other co-authors had in the Independent School Magazine, um, uh, I think it might've been last fall, uh, last fall's issue, uh, that this is a time uh, to emphasize Maslow's hierarchy over Bloom's taxonomy. I just, I, I, I really, uh, I wrote that, I wrote that phrase down. I thought it was a wonderful way to characterize the other aspects of learning besides the, the strictly academic. And I certainly be the first person to underline um, that these CTP results are about grade level expectations in academic learning in these subject areas. These are, that's an important part of what schools do, but these are unusual times to say the least, and it's only a part of what schools do. Very good points. Um, before we go to the q and I'm going to organize that while I ask you to share your thoughts on what do you think academic leaders should be asking on campus? What questions should they be asking on campus? 
Great. I um I was I was just wondering. So what I thought I had one or two more slides, and I think I, I think it is time to go to Q and A. Again, the, um, uh, the we looked at this uh, uh, low, middle, and high boys and girls by um, for the quantitative and the verbal reasoning as well as the the subject tests, and you see exactly the same pattern. Uh, it's, it's in fact exaggerated uh, compared to the subject tests. Um, the biggest penalty paid by the boys and, and the girls uh, who are in the bottom quartile. But again, the high achieving girls also in, the, in reasoning growth from one year to the next, um, uh, actually blossoming, flourishing um, under the uh, remarkably disruptive conditions that, uh, that started in spring of, of 2020. Um, and I, I, I think that's it. I, I did have a, a little riff on, um, uh, Sarah, I don't know if this is the place, but. Uh, you know, what else might we want to look at uh, in, in the future? And um, I felt that uh, the um, one thing that I would like to be able to do as a spring uh, 2021 testing data come in is I'd like to also be able to divide the students uh, according to some of the aspects of their social emotional learning. We do have an assessment of that that some schools use. And um, some students, for example, are um, you know, much more adept at the skills of self-management, um, uh, you know, independently organizing work, persistence and following through. Um, uh, and those students might have done better under the conditions of um, uh, hybrid and distance learning than others. We'd like to be able to find out. Again, it's another way, I think, for teachers and administrators to identify those students who might need special help or a different approach as we uh, as we get back toward a toward a normal. Yeah, one of the ways you put that to me earlier was it would be interesting as a school leader to sit down and look at who doesn't seem to be performing as expected. And you know, based on this kind of data and then look at the why behind that and that's going to be very individualized. Absolutely and very contextualized to the school and and what they've been doing um, this past year since not, you know, in different regions of the country conditions have been have been quite different. So these are aggregated results. Obviously, it does say something about the independent school sector as a whole. But in the end, each student is a student and is an individual. And I think that for those schools that have data similar to these, uh, looking at the individual students and asking where are they and what do they need will be really important. So we've got a couple of questions about your data sets. So I'm going to present those maybe a little bit together. Um, one is how did you decide to look at the growth from 1819 versus including 1718 and maybe even 1617? Um, uh, we, we could have looked at a longer period of uh, sort of pre-COVID time, absolutely. Uh, the longer you extend the timeline, the more you're going to lose some students and some schools out of the, out of the sample, uh, simply because if a school didn't test in, let's say, fall of 2015, and that was our, our time frame, then we would have fewer students. So uh, it's a great question, and in the end, it's kind of a, a, kind of a trade-off answer to that question that we felt that going back one year before COVID would give us enough of a baseline especially because, and I want to emphasize this, um, we also examined that subgroup of students who were then in our study based on that definition and looked at their growth rates against the growth rates against the way larger group of students for whom we have uh, CTP data over quite a long period of time. And it was very, very typical. The 1819 results that I showed you for this group looks a lot like what uh, 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 a, the, the much larger sample of CTP test takers would look like. Okay. And then do you anticipate following this smaller group into the future? Uh, yes, at least if there's not, again, same sort of partly the same answer, if there's not too much attrition out of that sample, but if this same group uh, does test again in the fall of uh, 2021, we absolutely are going to uh, take another look at it. There's, um, as, as uh, many people know, schools tend to do CTP testing either in the fall or the spring. This is obviously using a set of fall testing schools. What we will do and we'll be able to do in a few months is do a similar analysis for schools that have tested uh, traditionally in the spring. 
That's a much larger group of schools, by the way, who tend to do CTP at the end of the school year rather than near the beginning of the school year. And um, so that will give us uh, yet another uh, sort of panel of students and another, another way to, to look at this. And we'll get those results out as soon as we have them. So a question related to that maybe is one of the participants asked, were the fewer students able to do testing during COVID? So is the data skewed towards schools that were able to do in-person learning in the fall? Is that who was in the data set? Um, it is a great question. And I can't tell you off the top of my head um, whether the, uh, uh, what the distribution of schools was in this panel that did um, mostly in-person or a, a mix of the two or mostly distance. But just to be clear, the CTP tests are also administered at home. I mean, we developed that capacity very quickly last spring, recognizing that there would be the need. So these were not necessarily tests taken in the school, uh, okay. meaning that, th that this wasn't a biased sample only of, uh, of uh, students who were in fact in school. It's, it's, a, gr it's a great question and actually um, I probably could investigate a little more deeply the uh, circumstances of the schools that these students come from. Um, of course, we don't normally know. I mean, schools administer tests and we send them score reports and uh, uh, they do the interpretation. But I think we maybe should communicate with those schools and ask them to tell us uh, what their fall uh, instructional experience was. Yeah, I think that would be great. And if you do that, I'll, I'll append it to the recording of this webinar. So if you're watching this in a recording, look down below to see if there's an update there. Yeah. Um, another question is, could schools provide racial data in order to avoid stereotype, stereotype threat, but make the information more available? Yes, that's exactly the route that, um, that we would like to go. Remember, the whole, the whole project at ERB of compiling these student records and doing these kinds of analyses is a pretty new project. Um, so we have the assessment data, but it will take school collaboration to um, merge that with the school's information on racial and ethnic identity. And by the way, the same point holds for other data that schools collect. They know, um, they sometimes do student engagement surveys. Um, obviously, they have grades and transcripts, uh, to, to, name a, to name a clear one. Um, there might be um, uh, some interesting differences between students who've, um, who, are, who are athletes who are involved in after-school activities where they affected more deeply by the removal of those opportunities than other students. So many other questions that um, are important to understand the, the total school experience and educational environment that we can't touch limited only to our assessment data. So we got a question in the chat and we have another in the q and I just wanna remind everybody if you can put them in the Q&A, but from the chat, we have some, an observation really, which is about the high achieving girls. And one question is, are they more likely to be in all girls schools? And I don't know if you know that from your data set. And then is it relieving social pressures of girls that has enabled them to thrive and grow in this way during the, the pandemic? I, I think we've all been so deeply interested to um, speculate based on our experience and intuition uh, as to what it is that, that created this, um, uh, this pattern for high achieving girls. Uh, there, is, uh, 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 there are one or two all girls schools in this uh, panel um, of fall, three consecutive falls of testing, but they're not all by any means. The majority of schools would in fact be uh, co-educational uh, in nature. Um, uh, the only other audience, as I mentioned, uh, that has seen these results is the audience of our board of trustees who are mostly heads of school from ERB member schools. Uh, two of whom are heads of all girls schools. And um, of course they both looked at this result and for what it's worth, um, their reaction was a feeling that um, many of the high achieving, and of course that, so that doesn't have the social pressure element that's referenced here, but many of the high achieving girls in their schools are holding up more than half of the sky as, uh, as is sometimes said, they are, the organizers, they are the student government, they are the yearbook, they are doing everything. And many of those activities 
simply came to a halt um, uh, beginning right. mid-March of, of last year. Um, liberating, if you will, uh, to use kind of a loaded word, those girls to focus more on their, on their uh, educational interests. Others will have other intuitions as to what's going on, but all I can say is the data are speaking very, very loudly to this, to this particular point. And I, I think it's one that school leaders have to really examine because whether or not those girls are okay and thriving is not answered by this particular performance metric. It's, it's one piece of their picture. And I think that's worth investigating. Again, fully, fully agreed. And I, um, I, I, I want to I repeat my enthusiasm for the next wave of this research will, I hope, have, we'll have enough data that combines SEL um, uh, assessment results with academic achievement assessment results. Because the other thing that does need to be said is, and it's obvious, but high achieving girls or any of these other categories are very diverse within. It's not as if everyone in that group is at that where you see the bar for that group. Some are doing even better and some are not doing as well. And again, we need to understand ultimately every student as an individual. That's a great reminder, thank you. So we've got time for one more question. Um, we've run a little bit over, but um, this is a great one. What advice can you give to schools that don't do standardized assessments? Would the data that you're sharing be helpful for those schools to use in making decisions? And what advice would you give to those schools for collecting data in the future? So there's a lot in there. Yeah, there, there is, and it is a great question. Let me let me start on the the advice part, and then and then uh, uh, maybe the other um, the other. How, how could you use this information uh, in the school? I, I, I'm going to say something that you know, kind of ultimately will sort of make me seem like the the crass president of ERB who's here in order to sell tests. But um, I, I get that the the, the whole. Um, uh, conversation around the value of assessment and the extent to which it might actually limit the educational vision of a school and the educational aspirations of a student. I, I get that. I'm the first person to understand that. But at this moment, more than any other, doing an assessment that it can be benchmarked against some, some standards, some external standards, to see where individual students are and who, who needs to be worked with and, and how is, I think, kind of important. And if a school didn't do assessment previously, and if you don't plan to do assessments a year or two from now, fine. This might be a moment to uh, do an assessment this spring or next fall to see where students are. Just my plea. It makes sense to me anyway. The more things are changing, the more you need to understand the impact of those changes on students. And if there's one thing that's true right now, things are changing massively. Right. And will continue to for a short time. Okay. Off, off the soapbox on that. Um, the, uh, my feeling is, and why I'm very excited to get these data out for uh, independent schools generally, is obviously these findings don't um, reflect the experience of every single independent school uh, and, and it might be different. But it does say something about the sector. And I do feel that some of the findings from the national uh, testing data that, you know, that states mandate of their public schools have been um, a little bit alarmist uh, about the, the extent of learning loss and whether there's a generation that will be marked throughout their lifetimes and so on and so forth. Now, I don't wanna, maybe that's true in some public school districts, but it is demonstrably not the case for independent school students. And I do know, I feel sure that school heads, for example, will be really pleased to see these data when they get uh, difficult questions from prospective parents or current parents or their board of trustees about demonstrating the value of the school and the, and the quality of the educational environment in these challenging times. Uh, because this does show that yes, some loss of momentum, but something that can very much be recovered uh, in the coming year. And certainly COVID learning loss as a phrase is not something we're seeing at all. And by the way, even when we drill down to the individual student, we just don't see backward movement at all um, uh, in, among independent school students. So there is, I think, a value for, uh, even if a school is not collecting its own assessment data, uh, for having uh, access to these as a member of the independent school community 
and understanding that the, uh, the discourse about um, the impact of these disruptions on student learning in independent schools is a little bit different than the discourse uh, nationally. You know what, I think if I were gonna say anything summative at the end, it would be that there is not a COVID learning loss. It's a different kind of growth. In some ways, it's a slowing in growth that we wanna address, but it's not a loss. Thank you so much, Tom. I, I would uh, I would fully fully agree with that. And you know, um, uh, although there aren't formal standardized assessments, I think one of the things that um, might be really interesting to explore in, uh, in in classrooms is to have students reflect on the experiences they had that maybe provided special learning and growth opportunities for them outside of the the metrics of the of the academic achievement that are part of CTP. And because one way, of course, I mean, learning isn't really learning until you reflect on it and internalize it. And students are, as you pointed out, Sarah, having a lot of experiences now that um, they probably do need to reflect on, internalize, capitalize on, and then build into their overall fund of abilities uh, going forward. Great. Well, thank you again so much for coming. And um, I think we're going to want to have you back. <laughs> Great, thanks. I'll be so pleased to come back, especially when we have more data. In the meantime, everybody, for those of you who are ERB members, please go to the member portal uh, beginning, I, I believe this Friday, we'll, we'll have it up there. And you'll see a, a brief paper, it's about, I think it's about an eight page paper, contains these graphs, a little bit of description around them, um, the material that you've seen, but shareable uh, with your colleagues. And I'm very much looking forward to having it shared. And we are very much looking forward to getting any feedback thoughts, further questions you might have. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everyone.